Let's discover etiquette in Italy. When is the wrong time to drink a cappuccino or to eat tiramisu? Should we eat pizza with our hands or with a knife and fork? Aperitivo, what is it? And how should one pay for it? Plus business etiquette tips on greetings, building trust and giving feedback. Join me now for an interview with Elisa Mortarelle, a member of our Minding Manners International Network of Certified International Etiquette and Protocol Consultants. Are you ready? Let's go. Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to Minding Manners International. I'm Tomiko Brown Zabli, and I firmly believe that today, if etiquette training is not being delivered, focusing on international, then it is simply no longer relevant. So thank you for joining us in this first of our international etiquette series, where today we have the great pleasure of welcoming Elisa Mortrelle. She's joining us from Milano. Elisa, welcome. It is such an honor and a pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you, Tamiko. It's such a big pleasure to be here with you today. I'm very happy. And we are very happy to have you here, Elisa. We are going to spend the next few minutes looking at ways to help our viewers feel more confident, more polished and refined when visiting or working in Italy. Now, you know that I have a great passion for Italy. When I was at university, I had an amazing art history teacher who just had an extraordinary ability to bring beauty right there into our classroom, but it wasn't close enough. I wanted to go to Italy and see the bronze doors with my own eyes. So I got on the airplane, flew across the world, and of course I arrive and committed blunder after blunder after blunder, as one would expect from a teenager. However, it was years later when I went back to Italy to work in Milan. And at that point, I realized I was still subtly committing a few errors. And I would like you to share with our viewers today some of the notions that they can understand to help them become more at ease in doing business in Italy or traveling as a visitor and not make all of those mistakes. You can share with us some social etiquette concepts, business etiquette concepts, or both. What would you like to share with everyone? Uh, well, actually, to I think that to be effective in Italy, uh, you need to be uh, aware of the culture and to be aware of the way we Italians communicate. We are famous for that. So I think that to really mix in um, well, you need to develop uh, some kind of familiarity with our uh, very expressive way of talking and our very expressive body language. If you're just visiting Italy for a short time, I have to say that we can tell like, tourists from uh, habitués, from like smaller details. For instance, the cappuccino. Yes. Indeed, we did talk about that on our Instagram post earlier this week. So what is the correct time to have a cappuccino and when should it be avoided? Every time is mainly in the morning. You might have one as a break mid-afternoon, even if it's not very common, but like you would never ever have a cappuccino after lunch or even worse with your food. So that's something when you see somebody in Italy with a cappuccino while eating, for instance, pasta, you say, oh, that's a tourist for sure. That is a very useful tip. Now in North America, for example, we love having larger cups of coffee and they're filled with milk, such as well, a cappuccino or a latte. And just having that cup, nursing it, holding it in our hands brings a certain amount of comfort. And we tend to take that coffee with us everywhere, even in portable cups. However, when I was working in Italy, one of the first things one of my colleagues shared with me was that milk in coffee is for the bambino. And I certainly did not want to be perceived as a child as I was trying to foray my way into this new career. So even little things that seem irrelevant have a great importance when we're trying to make a positive first impression, and even more importantly, to maintain a longer positive impression. That's true, that's true. And uh, what is also true is that we don't have as many 
uh, different coffee-based drinks. So, you know, the different lattes, frappuccinos and with everything mixed in. So we have some kind of respect for coffee and um, coffee savvy people, they say you shouldn't even add sugar because it alters the flavor and you get served a small um, uh, cup of water, small glass of water so that you can cleanse your mouth before you savor your coffee. So um, yes, there is uh, some artistry around coffee in this country. Oh, this is beautiful. I'm sure anyone who has been to Italy can appreciate that Italians have a very special way of seeing beauty in absolutely everything. Beauty in architecture, beauty in clothing, beauty in people, beauty in everything. And that includes coffee. So it's wonderful if we can take an opportunity to cultivate our taste buds, to refine our palate. In that way, we can appreciate the subtleties and the nuances of the coffee when visiting Italy. Not everyone is accustomed to drinking coffee that is so strong. Will can be actually quite strong. Indeed, indeed. I have another notion around food that I would like to discuss about uh, in Italy. I have a lovely Italian neighbor who's an opera singer, and she often invites me to her place for aperitivo. Could you share with us a little bit about aperitivo? Yes, of course. So in Italy, eating... Uh, um is something that you do usually at the table, at lunchtime, at dinner time. So we are very kind of strict ab about that. We don't snack that much. The big exception is aperitivo. Aperitivo is has become very popular over the past decades, just because it's uh, a very informal ways of making friends. It gives you the pleasure of a light um, alcohol drink. So we, we usually don't have heavy cocktails for aperitivo as it happens. I have seen uh, in foreign countries, you go for the so-called aperitivo and you get served a vodka tonic or something else. And it's not something we would do. Something very typical in Italy for aperitivo would be, for instance, like in Northern Italy, a drink that comes from Venice, the spritz. So it's like uh, white wine and some seltz water and a little bit of bitter, but it's something very enjoyable that's not going to leave you tipsy or drunk. And we have some small kind of finger food that go with aperitivo. So now the aperitivo nowadays, it's a very, a very popular alternative to dinner. Oh, excellent. So you would do one or the other? Yes. Okay. Uh, in in mo most of the times, so yes. Hmm. And so if we'd like to have tiramisu, would we have to wait until dinner? Okay. Definitely. Usually aperitivo, we only have savory foods. It's very popular. Uh, you're in Milan, especially or in large cities like in Rome, in uh, Florence, to have the so-called happy hour. So, so th that's not the, what the happy hour is in other countries where you buy one drink and get another. Usually what a happy hour is, is that you buy an aperitivo and you get the access to food. So you buy a drink, for instance, a spritz and you get access to a buffet. Ooh, that's a very cheeky idea from a commercial perspective, because obviously the more savory foods we eat, the more we're going to be thirsty and then purchase those lovely, delicious drinks afterwards. But now let's say we're coming together as a group of friends or a group of colleagues, and we go to have an aperitivo at a restaurant. How are we going to take care of that situation? Will everyone pay for their own? Will we split it? Is it the person who invites, who does the, the billing? Or are we going to be able to use our credit and debit cards? Please share a few pointers with us there. Yes, yeah, so usually if you go to, aperitivos are very common for a la large group of people. So everybody is going to pay, pay for their share. Also because usually uh, if you go to an aperitivo in a bar, um, they have, an amount that is fixed. So you pay like, let's say 15 euros and you get one drink and access to the buffet or food or some, well, now we don't have as many buffet as in the past. So now you get your portion of uh, different kind of savory, small bites, etc. If you go to somebody's house, uh, then you get, 
usually what you get served is some kind of small um, cold cuts and veggies and of course uh, either white sparkling wine or something like that. <laughs> In terms of paying, uh, of course, in larger cities, it's very common to pay with credit card, etc. But when you go to smaller stores, maybe not in the center or in smaller towns, so well, credit cards are not uh, as common as elsewhere. Let's say, let's put it like that. Absolutely. Thank you for that great tip. And it's very important that we manage our expectations and do not make assumptions. Um, even simply, I went to Paris a couple of weeks ago with my daughter and she wanted to use her Apple Pay to take the Metro and it did not work. So we always need to make sure we have a backup plan. Now, Elisa, as an etiquette consultant, we pay particular attention to all of these nuances, but you've traveled all around the world, and I would like to invite you to share with everyone some of the challenges that you have had as an Italian or ways you have had to adapt your behavior or expectations when traveling or working abroad. When I traveled abroad, but also when I was here in Italy working with foreign people, I really uh, struggled to keep my tone of voice, my speaking volume, my body language to a minimal level, because I know for non-Italians, it might be something distracting and confusing. Mm, we have a very intense style of communication. And of course, uh, this might appear a little bit excessive to somebody let's say from Britain, not to speak uh, about, for instance, a Japanese, a person from Japan. Uh, another thing that I really uh, noticed, especially when I have to say that, especially while working with Americans, I realized how direct we Italians can be when providing feedback. The Americans I have been working with, at least, are usually very careful when they provide feedback that is not 100% positive. Mm -hmm. So they are very mindful about packaging it in a nice way and, you know, um, stress the positive points mm -hmm. before you get to the bad ones, etc. Well, in Italy, that's totally uncommon we go straight to what's not working and that for when you are liaising with people that are used to a different kind of uh, communication that might make you sound rude downright rude so yes that 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 was a very interesting point i always thought about italian culture about being very open very warm very friendly but i also realized that it can be rather direct compared to other communication styles so th that was something that mm, I, I was not expecting honestly what a brilliant example in America, we do what is called the hamburger method. We put the criticism in the middle and we package it with the bun of happiness or something positive on one side and another bun of something positive on the other side. It's also known as the positive improvement positive method. So share something positive, focus on what needs to be improved and then end with something positive. Now, we believe that that is the best way of providing feedback because it doesn't leave someone feeling that you're attacking them or being condescending or, or anything negative and it leaves them on a happy note and then they go off and think about it and then focus on what's in the middle. It is important when communicating in that style though that you give very feasible action points so that people People know what to do with the information that has been shared. However, many people who are not accustomed to that style of feedback will walk away feeling confused. Does he or she want me to do something better or are they happy with my performance? I'm not quite sure. And then nothing happens. So it is very important that we are able to recognize that communication has a variety of different contexts and we need to understand is the person we're communicating with more of a direct context culture or an indirect context culture. I often say that if I were to share with you a beautiful poem in Japanese, perfect grammar, perfect syntax, everything 
is beautiful, but you do not understand Japanese, then am I communicating effectively? Absolutely not. So the key is going to be not just making sure you say what needs to be said, but making sure it is said in a way that will be understood. And in fact, that is what intercultural communication and international business etiquette is all about. I completely agree with you. And I think it's so key today, it's paramount to be aware of these differences because it's very easy that misunderstandings happen and in the business setting, a misunderstanding means a, a deal that is not closed. Exactly. And no one is going to tell you what you've done wrong because often they don't even know. However, they can sense that something is not quite right. Now, that leads me to another question. You mentioned America. America is very pragmatic in its approach to business. We focus on productivity and efficiency. Time is money. Whereas in Italy, you have this notion of la dolce vita, the sweet life. People spend more time doing things together. So could you share, how does one build trust in Italy? That could be trust in entering a new social scene, perhaps as an expatriate, or it could be building trust in the work sense. Miko, I think that uh, in Italy, one key point about uh, building trust is something that is rather typical of Italian culture, and we call it la bella figura. So what is la bella figura? It may, Literally, it means something like making a good impression, but it's so much more important than just that. It's, I think it's a very Italian concept. So you will make a bella figura if you're dressed in a proper way, if you appear to be at ease with people, um, if you appear to be in your element, that is key, to be natural, to be at ease. So I think this is something that strikes uh, uh, the right point when you do business here in Italy. And of course, uh, another key point being a high relationship uh, uh, culture is the fact of having connection or even a appearing to have connections. So the, the line here is uh, blurred. So definitely people will, uh, when they meet you here in Italy, probably they will, uh, <clears throat> in order to build trust, they will investigate a little bit about you. And they will want to know if you know somebody in common, because that's a very strong way of building trust in Italy, referrals from other people that are trusted already. Hmm. And in building these relationships, of course, we have to go back to the beginning, the meeting and greeting. So when we're in Italy, we often hear people saying ciao, ciao, but there must be a more formal way. Could you share that with us? Of course. So ciao is mm, hello. So ha, mm, not even hello, maybe hi. So it's very informal. It's something we definitely use with our family, with our friends, uh, but it's connected with a low level of formality. As you might be aware of, we have a double level of formality in Italian language. So we can use the two uh, with the people uh, we are familiar with and we have like the courtesy form a delay for the people we are not familiar with. Uh, so usually ciao is associated with the lowest uh, uh, formality level. Buongiorno and buonasera correspond to a higher formality level. Usually you say buongiorno, buonasera when you then are going to use the courtesy form. Yes. We actually have one other word, one other greeting that is in between. So when you use it, uh, you're not declaring whether you are familiar or not familiar. And this is one main reason uh, for it not being very appreciated uh, because it's so indetermined and it's salve. Okay. It's, um, it, it's a word that comes, uh, it means literally health. Mm -hmm. uh, and it comes from Latin. The problem is that because it has like this Latin origin, it was widely promoted 
last century when we had fascists, unfortunately. So even for this reason, today it is better avoided. Even if, if you come to Italy or not, if when you come to Italy, you will hear it a lot. Now this touches on another point about the importance of etiquette. It isn't just about sharing with people what we should do and what we should not do. It's about also being able to intertwine the historical aspects. And when we know why we do things or perhaps why we used to do things and no longer do things as in the example you just shared with us, that is going to give us a great ability to achieve and to interact at a much higher level. And that is what building relationships and sustaining them is all about. So thank you, Elisa, thank you so much for that. Now, I have one more question for you and it's much more lighthearted. It's about pizza. In England, here we eat everything with a knife and fork, but I know there's a lot of controversy around that subject. So Elisa, as the Italian, could you please share with us how you and how we should eat pizza. So, Tamiko, the question is tricky because uh, I have no final response. Uh, we are, even in Italy, we are divided on this topic. Uh, some people say it's better eaten with hands. Uh, pizza is better eaten with hands because originally, originally it was a street food. So it was supposed to be eaten with, with your hands, uh, like folding it. Um, at the same time, they also say, well, it's bakery because mm -hmm. so it's related to bread. It's like a cousin of the bread, another reason for picking it up with your hands. Okay. On the other side, uh, nowadays we mostly do not eat pizza as a street food on the street, but we do eat pizza in restaurants, in pizzerias, and there you are provided with knife and fork. Um, depending on the style of pizza, it might be very thin. So lifting it with your hands might lead to a, some kind of disaster. So for this reason, uh, some people do prefer to use knife and fork. I have to say that there is also a third way, which is you cut your pizza slice with knife and fork, you eat the center, that's the softest part, that's the part that's going to collapse when you try to lift it with your fork and knife, and then you can eat the border with your fingers. Of course, picking it up with, with fingers is something you will do in a non-formal setting, but pizza is a non-formal food, so it's rather, I, I cannot actually think of a formal restaurant serving pizza. So I think you can do that. Why don't we begin in Puglia and just go through all of the different cities and villages on our way up to Milano. And I'm sure that on our way, we're going to find a variety of different dishes and a variety of ways to eat various dishes. Because obviously in every country, there's more than one correct way to do things. Um, on that note, Elisa, would you say that in Milan, there is a different way of interacting than doing so in the Southern regions? Yes, it's completely different, very different. And we also joke a lot about that and we make fun of that uh, among Italians. Also, like Milan, of course, in Milan, people are not uh, only from Milan. Uh, it's a little bit of a magnet. So we have people from uh, all around Italy and, and people joke about that because in Southern Italy, uh, culture is closer to Mediterranean cultures, so also in terms of body language, uh, of um, st communication style, family tradition, much closer to the Mediterranean world for geographical reasons. And time as well, right? <laughs> of course, yes. Another point I was about to forget, but also time is very, can be very relative. While in Northern Italy, we are closer to Central Europe. Um, so of course, uh, we might um, have a different communication style. We tend to be uh, more reliable when it comes to punctuality. Uh, and we are perceived as colder and more detached compared to people coming from Southern Italy. So we both have our ups 
both the upsides and downsides. You have shared so very much with us today, Elisa. Grazie mille. I am honored to have you as a member of the Minding Manners International Network of Etiquette and Protocol Consultants. I hope today is the beginning of many, and I'm certain that everyone would love to stay in touch with you. So would you please share with us your Instagram handle? Yes, of course. Uh, it's um, name and surname, so Elisa underscore Motterle. I'll be putting out a link to your book as well, Elisa. So for anyone who would like to know more about etiquette in Italy, they'll be delighted to have an opportunity to carry on the journey with you. It has been an absolute pleasure and I wish you a wonderful day and much continued success and happiness. Have Thank you, Tamiko. It was really a great pleasure and a huge honor to be here with you today. And it was a very lovely chat. So thank you so much for having me. You are most welcome.